you know, I've been reading more and more about Taiwan because it is increasingly in the news. And there are some out there speculating that after generations of fighting wars over oil, the next wars are going to be fought over chips in this digital world. And TSM, that's the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, they control about 90% of production of silicon chips. And so, you know, we're seeing the tone of media reports changing about China and Taiwan. It's becoming more dramatic. So is it possible, Colonel McGregor, knowing the influence of our intelligence agencies over the media and over politicians, that the U.S. is maybe trying to scare Taiwan and we are raising the tension and the temperature to incentivize them to move their chip technology to the U.S. because we don't want to tolerate China eventually having a monopoly over that industry? Well, a couple of points. First of all, remember, Japan and South Korea are equally dependent upon that microcircuitry being produced in uh, Taiwan. And if you look look at Taiwan from a purely economic standpoint, Taiwan and South Korea are both largely extensions in economic terms of Japan. Now, the hatchet is being buried between Japan and China. We keep assuming that somehow or another Japanese will jump on board with us and help us fight the Chinese. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Chinese have opened their markets to Japan. And one of the principal reasons for conflict over the last several hundred years between Japan and China was the unwillingness of the Chinese to open their markets unless the Japanese paid tribute to the Chinese emperor. Well, the Japanese said, no, we don't pay tribute to anybody, and you've got lots of wars. Everybody else in Asia essentially paid a fee to get into the Chinese market. Well, Xi very wisely has said that's over, because that's been the source of war and conflict in Asia for hundreds of years. So now you've got the Japanese that are keenly interested in their access to Taiwan, along with the South Koreans. And here we come along. And and how long have we stood around since the 1980s? I mean, this business of shipping jobs and industries overseas began under President Reagan. Nobody ever points that out. It took, it got started in the 80s, and it really went uh, in high gear during the 90s under Clinton. Remember Clinton saying, well, the jobs aren't coming back. Well, it's just not coming back. Well, we didn't do what the Germans did or the Japanese or others and say, wait a minute, we're not going to allow X number of manufacturers, X number of factories, X number of whatever in our production base to go overseas. President Trump tried very hard and came to an agreement with the firm on Taiwan that produces these microchips. And he wanted to build a facility in Arizona. And that, you know, he said, we'll, we'll give you whatever you know, breaks are required tax-wise. We want to have a manufacturing facility here in the United States. We want to employ U.S. labor. Well, as soon as he was out of office, where did that go? Away. And all of a sudden now people are saying, we have to go to war to gain access to microchips? Well, that's insane. Everybody in Taiwan is going to be happy to sell you your microcircuitry. You don't have to go to war to get it. It's a friend of mine once said, Doug, Why do Americans think they have to park a tank on top of the oil well to get at the oil? The Arabs will sell it to you. Saddam Hussein, whether you like him or not, would have sold you all the oil you wanted. So the bottom line is we got to get out of this 19th century mindset. We're not in the game. The game is not military. It's not, I have more of X than you do, and I can destroy you, and so forth. It's not part of the discussion. It's not in the strategic calculus. As far as Northeast Asia and the West are concerned, those are the two major poles of scientific industrial power and understanding in the world. should be no war between us. It's unnecessary. Now, that doesn't mean we won't have problems elsewhere. But the point is, there's no need to go to war for microcircuitry. I think I heard this Representative McCall in Texas make some sort of stupid remark like that. Again, there's this underlying supposition that if you do something we don't like, you must be the enemy. Lots of people do things they don't, we don't like. We do lots of things other people don't like. Doesn't make us enemies.
Right. That's well said. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about where it's all going. Millennials are coming into power as sort of this next generation that's searching for answers to the problems that are impacting us, especially economically. It's why people like me have turned to things like Bitcoin. So what advice do you have for younger generations on how the U.S. should position itself? What is the ideal role for the U.S. and the U.S. military going forward? And can we expect a multipolar world? Well, as far as millennials are concerned, I, I hope the right millennials end up in charge because the millennials coming out of the Ivy Leagues and the service academies are all brainwashed into this globalist uh, world order nonsense. We've got to get out of that business. We've got to understand that we, we are not imposing order on the world. The world is always somewhat disorderly and will remain somewhat disorderly. That's not all bad. We are a participant in the world, but we don't control it, nor do we want to. It's a bankrupting exercise. Everybody who's tried hegemony has failed and ultimately ended up ruined in bankruptcy. So we don't want to do that anyway. Secondly, <clears throat> understand that we need to look at defense from the standpoint of defense. We need to get out of this business of intervening in other people's countries because of a particular lobby in the United States. And there are many, many lobbies, foreign lobbies in the United States, that are also connected to defense industries that have an interest in conflict because they want to sell their products. We've got to get control of this thing, and we need to scale back our investments in defense, but we need to invest more prudently and competently. You know, we have 44 four-star generals on active duty today. When I say generals or admirals, 44. And we have perhaps 1.1 million people in uniform. Now, at the height of the Second World War, when we had 12 million men in uniform, we had seven four-stars. Wow. What's wrong with this picture? Now, your millennials out there must have learned something in business school about uh, overhead and the tax that you pay for a monstrous and unnecessary overhead. The overhead in American national defense is atrocious. It's outrageous. We have been busily hollowing out the military from year to year to year, the, the people who actually deploy and fight, and keeping all of the generals and adding to them. Again, every time there's an opportunity for an intervention, the, the Defense Department comes across and says, well, you need more admirals, more generals to run the intervention. It's, it's crazy. So that we've got to get control of that thing. And then we have to really focus on what do we need as opposed to what do we really, what do we want? In other words, there's always a wish list. Then there's a need list. We've got to get back to what do we need? Do you really think we need 10,000 nuclear warheads? Are 5,000 nuclear warheads enough? Are 2,000 enough? I once had a French general tell me, Douglas, one warhead is enough. <laughs> In other words, anybody who thinks you're going to use one warhead against them mm -hmm. scares the living hell out of them. And and by the way, that's appropriate because nuclear weapons are terrible, ruin life on Earth. Nobody wants to go there because Washington, D.C. is a money machine. And anyone who steps forward and says these things, and by the way, President Trump has said some of these things too, it threatens the money flow. We've got to stop it. We can't afford it. Right. We've enjoyed the privilege of that deficit without tears, right? We've been able to print, print, print. Our leaders only think as far as the next election cycle. Some of Correct. them can't think past 10 years because they're in their 80s. And people like me, we don't have a 10-year time horizon. We're looking out 40, 50 years. So, I mean, what do you think this country looks like several decades from now? Depends. The, the, the top priority for the United States in terms of national defense, first and foremost, close the border. Stop the influx of millions of people for whom, frankly, we, we, it's not a question of room. Everybody will say, well, we've got lots of space. We, we can't employ them. We can't absorb them and, re, and, per, and put them to good purpose and use. So that's the first thing. Second thing is we've got to restore the rule of law inside the United States. Anyone who comes from overseas tells you they love to do business in the United States because they don't have to pay the bribes to everyone in sight that is usually required around the world. But the rule of law has broken down in too much of our country. You know, so those are the two things that have to happen right away. The rule of law also means 
a lot of these people that have come here illegally are going to have to leave. That doesn't mean they can't come back legally. But where do we put them? Where do we house them? And if we're headed into a period of scarcity, as opposed to the enormous abundance that we've enjoyed, it's very dangerous to bring in millions of people that you look at and regard as foreigners. Because then the foreigner is seen as somebody taking your job, absorbing your benefits. Do you you understand what I'm saying? It's a very dangerous situation. We haven't been thinking about any of these things because we don't see the pain train that we're about to ride. All we've seen is the fun train, the party train. Get on, party away. There's plenty of coal left. The The locomotive will keep running. Well, the locomotive is grinding slowly to a halt. It may not make it much longer. What do you do then? You have to start throwing people off the train. 